Welcome to the finale of STS Spooktober 2023. This is the conclusion of Everything's Eventual by Stephen King. Part 10. I didn't tell Mr. Sharpton all that, but I told him what he wanted to know about Skipper. I decided I could trust him. Maybe that secret part of me knew I could trust him, but I don't think so. I think it was just the way he put his hand on my arm, like your dad would. Not that I have a dad, but I can imagine. Plus, it was like he said, even if he was a cop and arrested me, what judge and jury would believe Skipper Brannigan actually had driven his car off the road because of a letter I sent him? especially one full of nonsense words and symbols made up by a pizza delivery boy who flunked high school geometry twice. When I was done, there was silence between us for a long time. At last, Mr. Sharpton said, He deserved it. You know that, don't you? And for some reason, that did it. The dam burst... I cried like a baby. I must have cried for 15 minutes or more. Mr. Sharpton put his arm around me and pulled me against his chest, and I watered the lapel of his suit. If someone had driven by and seen us that way, they probably would have thought we were a couple of queers for sure, but nobody did. There was just him and me under the yellow mercury vapor lamps there by the cart corral. <sighs> yippee ty, yippee yo, get along, little shopping carts. Pug used to sing. For you know, Super Saver will be your new home. <sighs> We'd laugh till we cried. At last, I was able to turn off the waterworks. Mr. Sharpton handed me a hanky and I wiped my eyes with it. How did you know? I asked. My voice sounded all deep and weird, like a foghorn. Once you were spotted... All it took was a little rudimentary detective work. Yeah, but how was I spotted? We have certain people, a dozen or so in all, who look for fellows and gals like you. They can actually see fellows and gals like you, Dink, the way certain satellites in space can see nuclear piles and power plants. You folks show up yellow, like... Match flames is how this one spotter described it to me. He shook his head and gave a wry little smile. <laughs> I'd like to see something like that just once in my life. Or be able to do what you do. Of course, I'd also like to be given a day. <laughs> just one would be fine where I could paint like Picasso or write like Faulkner. I gaped at him. Is that true? There's people who can see? Yes, there are bloodhounds. <laughs> they crisscross the country and all the other countries looking for that bright yellow glow, looking for match heads in the darkness. This particular young woman was on Route 90, actually headed for Pittsburgh to catch a plane home to grab a little R&R &R when she saw you or sensed you or whatever it is they do. The finders don't really know themselves any more than you really know what you did to Skipper, do you? What? Uh, he raised a hand. I told you that you wouldn't get all the answers you like. This is something you'll have to decide on the basis of what you feel, not on what you know. But I can tell you a couple of things. To begin with, Dink, I work for an outfit called the Trans Corporation. Our job is getting rid of the world's skipper Brannigans, the big ones, who do it on a grand scale. We have a company headquarters in Chicago and a training center in Peoria where you'll spend a week if you agree to my proposal. I didn't say anything then, but I knew already that I was going to say yes to his proposal. Whatever it was, I was going to say yes. You're a tranny, my young friend. <laughs> Better get used to the idea. What is it? A trait. 
There are folks in our organization who think of what you have, um, what you can do as a talent or an ability or, or even a kind of glitch, but they're wrong. Talent and ability are born of trait. Trait is general. Talent and ability are specific. You'll have to simplify that. I am a high school dropout, remember? I know. I also know that you didn't drop out because you were stupid. You dropped out because you didn't fit in. In that way, you are like every other tranny I've met. (laughs) He laughed in the sharp way people do when they're not really amused. All 21 of them. Now listen to me and don't play dumb. Creativity is like a hand at the end of your arm. But a hand has many fingers, doesn't it? Well, at least five. Think of those fingers as abilities. A creative person may write, paint, sculpt, think up math formulae. He or she may dance or sing or play a musical instrument. Those are the fingers. But creativity is the hand that gives them life. And just as all hands are basically the same, form follows function. All creative people are the same once you get down to the place where the fingers join. Trans is also like a hand. Sometimes its fingers are called uh, precognition, the ability to see the future. Sometimes they're postcognition, the ability to see the past. We have a guy who knows who killed John F. Kennedy, and it wasn't Lee Harvey Oswald. It was, in fact, a woman. There's telepathy, pyrokinesis, telepathy, and who knows how many others. We don't know, certainly. This is a new world, and we've barely begun to explore its first continent. But trans is different from creativity in one vital way. It's much rarer. One person in 800 is what occupational psychologists call gifted. We believe that there may only be one tranny in every 8 million people. That took my breath away. The idea that you might be one in eight million would take anybody's breath away, right? That's about 120 for every billion ordinary folks. We think there may be no more than 3,000 so-called trannies in the whole world. We're finding them, one by one. It's slow work. The sensing ability is fairly low level, but we still only have a dozen or so finders, and each one takes a lot of training. This is a hard calling, but it is also fabulously rewarding. We're finding trainees and we're putting them to work. That's what we want to do with you, Dink. Put you to work. We want to help you focus your talent, sharpen it, and use it for the betterment of all mankind. You won't be able to see any of your old friends again. There's no security risk on earth like an old friend we found. And there's not a whole lot of cash in it. At least to begin with. But there's a lot of satisfaction. And what I'm going to offer you is only the bottom rung of what may turn out to be a very high ladder. Don't forget those fringe benefits. I said, kind of raising my voice on the last word, turning it into a question if he wanted to take it that way. He grinned and clapped me on the shoulders. (laughs) That's right. Those famous fringe benefits. By then, I was starting to get excited. My doubts weren't gone, but they were melting away. So tell me about it, I said. My heart was beating hard, but it wasn't fear. Not anymore. Make me an offer I can't refuse. Part 11. Three weeks later, I'm on an airplane for the first time in my life, and what a way to lose your cherry. 
The only passenger in a Lear 35, listening to Counting Crows pouring out of quad speakers with a Coke in one hand, watching as the altimeter climbs all the way to 42,000 feet. That's over a mile higher than most commercial jetliners fly, the pilot told me. And a ride as smooth as the seat of a girl's underpants. (laughs) I spent a week in Peoria, and I was homesick. Really homesick. Surprised the shit out of me. There's a couple of nights where I even cried myself to sleep. I'm ashamed to say that. But I've been truthful so far, and I don't want to start lying or leaving things out now. Ma was the least of what I missed. You'd think we would have been close, as it was us against the world, in a manner of speaking. But my mother was never much for loving and comforting. She didn't whip on my head or put out cigarettes in my armpits or anything like that. But so what? I mean... Big whoop. I've never had any kids, so I guess I can't say for sure, but I somehow don't think being a great parent is about the stuff you didn't do to your rug monkeys. Ma was always more into her friends than me, and her weekly trip to the beauty shop and Friday nights out at the reservation. Her big ambition in life was to win a 20-number bingo and drive home in a brand new Monte Carlo. I'm not sitting on the pity pot either. I'm just telling you how it was. Mr. Sharpton called Ma and told her that I'd been chosen to intern in the Trans Corporation's Advanced Computer Training and Placement Project, a special deal for non-diploma kids with potential. The story was actually pretty believable. I was a shitty math student and froze up almost completely in classes like English, where you were supposed to talk, but I was always on good terms with the school computers. In fact, although I don't like to brag, and I never let any of the faculty in on this little secret, I could program rings around Mr. Jacobois and Miss Wilcoxon. I never cared much about computer games. They're, they're strictly for dick brains, in my humble opinion. But I could key jack like a mad motherfucker. Pug used to drop by and watch me sometimes. I can't believe you, he said once. Man, you got that thing smoking and token. I shrugged. Any fool can peel the apple. It takes a real man to eat the core. So Ma believed it. She might have had a few more questions if she knew the Trans Corporation was flying me out to Illinois in a private jet, but she didn't. And I didn't miss her all that much. But I missed Pug and John Cassidy, who was our other friend from the Super Saver days. John plays in a punk band. He wears a gold ring in his left eyebrow and has just about every sub-pop record ever made. He cried when Kurt Cobain ate the dirt sandwich. Didn't try to hide it or blame it on allergies either. Just said, I'm sad because Kurt died. John's eventual. And I missed Harkerville, perverse but true. Being at the training center in Peoria was like being born again, somehow. And I guess being born always hurts. I thought I might meet some other people like me. If this was a book or a movie or maybe just an episode of The X-Files, I'd meet some cute chick with nifty little tits and the ability to shut doors from across the room. But that didn't happen. I'm pretty sure there were other trainees at Peoria when I got there, but Dr. Wentworth and the other folks running the place were careful to keep us separated. I once asked why and I got a runaround. That's when I started to realize that not everybody who had Transcorp printed on their shirts or walked around with Transcorp's clipboards was my pal or wanted to be my long-lost dad. And it was about killing people. That's what I was training for. The folks in Peoria didn't talk about that all the time, but no one tried to sugarcoat it either. I just had to remember the targets were bad guys, dictators and spies and serial killers. And as Mr. Sharpton said, people did it in wars all the time. Plus, it wasn't personal. No guns, no knives, no garros. I'd never get blood splashed on me. Like I told you, I never saw Mr. Sharpton again. At least not yet. I haven't. But I talked to him every day of the week I was in Peoria, and that eased the pain and strangeness considerably. Talking to him was like having someone put a cool cloth on your brow. 
He gave me his number the night we talked in his Mercedes, and he told me to call him any time, even at three in the morning if I was feeling upset. Once I did just that. I almost hung up on the second ring, because people may say call them any time, even at three in the morning, but they don't really expect you to do it. But I hung in there. I was homesick, yeah, but it was more than that. The place wasn't what I expected exactly, and I wanted to tell Mr. Sharpton, so... See how he took it, kinda. He answered on the third ring, and although he sounded sleepy, (laughs) big surprise there, huh? He didn't sound pissed at all. I told him that some of the stuff they were doing was quite weird. The test with all the flashing lights, for example. They say it was a test for epilepsy, but... (sighs) I went to sleep right in the middle of it, I said. And when I woke up, I had a headache and it was hard to think. You know what I felt like? A file cabinet after someone's been rummaging through it. What's your point, Dink? Mr. Sharpton asked. I think they hypnotized me. A brief pause. Then, maybe they did. Uh, Probably they did. But why? Why would they? I'm doing everything they ask. So why would they want to hypnotize me? I don't know all their routines and protocols, but I suspect they're programming you, putting a lot of housekeeping stuff on the lower levels of your mind so they won't have to junk up the conscious part and maybe screw up your special ability while they're at it. Really, no more different than programming a computer's hard disk, and no more sinister. But you don't know for sure... No, as I say, training and testing are not my purview. But I'll make some calls, and Dr. Wentworth will talk to you. It may even be that an apology is due. If that's the case, Dink, you may be sure that it will be tendered. Our trainees are too rare and too valuable to be upset needlessly. Now, is there anything else? I thought about it then said no. I thanked him and hung up. It had been on the tip of my tongue to tell him that I'd thought I'd been drugged as well, given some sort of mood elevator to help me through the worst of my homesickness. But in the end, I decided not to bother him. It was three in the morning, after all. And if they'd been giving me anything, it was probably for my own good. Part 12 Dr. Wentworth came to see me the next day. He was the big kahuna, and he did apologize. He was perfectly nice about it, but he had a look, I don't know, like maybe Mr. Sharpton had called him about two minutes after I hung up and gave him a hot reaming. Dr. Wentworth took me for a walk on the back lawn, green and rolling and damn near perfect there at the end of spring. And he said he's sorry for not keeping me up to speed. The epilepsy test really was an epilepsy test, he said, and a CAT scan, too. But since it induced a hypnotic state in most subjects, they usually took advantage of it to give certain baseline instructions. In my case, they were instructions about the computer programs I'd be using in Columbia City. Dr. Wentworth asked me if I had any other questions. I lied and said no. You probably think that's weird, But it's not. I I had a long and sucky school career, which ended three months short of graduation. I had teachers I liked as well as teachers I hated, but never one I entirely trusted. I was the kind of kid who always sat in the back of the room if the teacher's seating chart wasn't alphabetical and never took part in class discussions. I mostly said, huh, when I was called on, and wild horses wouldn't have dragged a question out of me. Mr. Sharpton was the only guy I ever met who was able to get into where I lived. And old Doc Wentworth, with his bald head and sharp eyes behind his little rimless glasses, was no Mr. Sharpton. I could imagine pigs flying south for the winter before I could imagine opening it up to that dude, let alone crying on his shoulder. And fuck, I I don't know what else to ask anyway. A lot of the time, I, I liked it in Peoria. And I was excited by the prospects ahead. New job, new town, new house. People were great to me in Peoria. (laughs) Even the food was great. 
meatloaf, fried chicken, milkshakes, everything I liked. Okay, I didn't like the diagnostic test. Those booger snots you have to do with an IBM pencil, and sometimes I'd feel dopey, as if someone had put something in my mashed potatoes. Or hyper, sometimes I'd feel that way too. And there were other times, at least two, when I was pretty sure I'd been hypnotized again. But so what? I mean, was any of it a big deal after you'd been chased around a supermarket parking lot by a maniac who was laughing and making race car noises and trying to run you over with a shopping cart? Part 13. I had one more talk on the phone with Mr. Sharpton that I suppose I should mention. That was just a day before my second airplane ride, the one that took me to Columbia City, where a guy was waiting with the keys to my new house. By then, I knew about the cleaners and the basic money rule. Start every week broke, end every week broke. And I knew who to call locally if I had a problem. Any big problem, and I call Mr. Sharpton, who's technically my control. I had maps, a list of restaurants, directions to the cinema complex and the mall. I had a line on everything, but the most important thing of all. Mr. Sharpton, I don't know what to do. I said, I was talking to him on the phone just outside the calf. There was a phone in my room, but by then I was too nervous to sit down, let alone lie in my bed. If they were still putting shit in my food, for sure it wasn't working that day. I can't help you there, Dink, he said, calm as ever. So sorry, Charlie. What do you mean? You've got to help me. You recruited me for Jeeper's sake. Let me give you a hypothetical case. Suppose... I'm the president of a well-endowed college. Do you know what well-endowed means? (laughs) Lots of bucks. I'm not stupid. I told you that. So you did. I apologize. Anyway, let's say that I, President Sharpton, use some of my school's plentiful bucks to hire a great novelist as the writer-in-residence, or a great pianist to teach music, Would that entitle me to tell the novelist what to write, or the pianist what to compose? Probably not. Absolutely not. But let's say it did. If I told the novelist, write a comedy about Betsy Ross screwing around with George Washington and Gay Perry, do you think he could do it? I got laughing. I couldn't help it. Mr. Sharpton's just got a vibe about him somehow. Maybe. (laughs) Especially if you whipped a bonus on the guy. Okay, but even if he held his nose and cranked it out, it would likely be a very bad novel. Because creative people aren't always in charge. And when they do their best work, they're hardly ever in charge. They're just sort of rolling along with their eyes shut, yelling, Wee! What's all that got to do with me? Listen, Mr. Sharpton, when I try to imagine what I'm going to do in Columbia City, all I see is a great big blank. Help people, you said. Make the world a better place. Get rid of the skippers. All that sounds great, except I don't know how to do it. You will. When the time comes, you will. You said Wentworth and his guys would focus my talent. Sharpen it. Mostly what they did is give me a bunch of stupid tests and make me feel like I was back in school. Is it all in my subconscious? Is it all on the hard disk? Trust me, Dink. Trust me. And trust yourself. So I did. I have. But just lately, things haven't been so good. Not good at all. That goddamn Neff. All the bad stuff started with him. I wish I'd never seen his picture. And if I had to see a picture, I wish I'd seen one where he wasn't smiling. Part 14. My first week in Columbia City, I did nothing. I mean, absolutely zilch. I didn't even go to the movies. When the cleaners came, I just went to the park and sat on a bench and felt like the whole world was watching me. When it came time to get rid of my extra money on Thursday, I ended up shredding better than $50 in the garbage disposal. 
And doing that was new to me then, remember? Talk about a weird feeling, man. You don't have a clue. While I was standing there listening to the motor under the sink grinding away, I kept thinking about Ma. If Ma had been there to see what I was doing, she probably would have run me through with a butcher knife to make me stop. That was a dozen 20 number bingo games, or, or two dozen coveralls, going straight down the kitchen pig. I slept like shit that week. Every now and then, I'd go to the little study. I didn't want to, but my feet would drag me there. Like they say, murderers always return to the scene of their crimes, I guess. Anyway, I'd stand there in the doorway and look at the dark computer screen, at the Global Village modem, and I'd just sweat with guilt and embarrassment and fear. Even the way the desk was so neat and clean, without a single paper or note on it, made me sweat. I could just about hear the walls muttering stuff like, Nah, nothing going on in here. And, Who's this turkey? The cable installer? I had nightmares. In one of them, the doorbell rings, and when I open it, Mr. Sharpton's there. He's got a pair of handcuffs. Put out your wrists, Dink. We thought you were a tranny, but obviously we were wrong. Sometimes it happens. No, I am. I am a tranny. I just need a little more time to get acclimated. I've never been away from home before, remember? You've had five years. I'm stunned. I can't believe it. But part of me knows it's true. It feels like days, but it's really been five fucking years, and I haven't turned on the computer in the little study a single time. If not for the cleaners, the desk it sits on would be six inches deep in dust. Hold out your hands, Dink. Stop making this hard on both of us. I won't, and you can't make me. He looks behind me then, and who should come up the steps but Skipper Brannigan. He's wearing his red nylon tunic, only now Transcorp is sewn on it instead of Super Saver. He looks pale, but otherwise okay. Not dead is what I mean. You thought you did something to me, but you didn't, Skipper says. You couldn't do anything to anyone. You're just a hippie waste. I'm going to put cuffs on him, Mr. Sharpton says to Skipper. If he gives me any trouble, run him over with a shopping cart. Totally eventual, Skipper says. And I wake up half out of bed and on the floor screaming part 15 then about 10 days after i moved in i had another kind of dream i don't remember what it was but it must have been a good one because when i woke up i was smiling i could feel it on my face a big happy smile it was like when i woke up with the idea about mr bukowski's dog almost exactly like that I pulled on a pair of jeans and went into the study. I turned on the computer and opened the window marked Tools. There was a program in there called Dinky's Notebook. I went right to it, and all my symbols were there. Triangles, circles, japs, mercs, rhomboids, bows, smims, fouders, hundreds more, thousands more, maybe millions more. It was sort of like Mr. Sharpton said, a new world, and I'm on the coastline of the first continent. All I know is that all at once it was there for me. I had a great big Macintosh computer to work with instead of a little piece of pink chalk. And all I had to do was type the words for the symbols and the symbols would appear. I was jacked to the max. I mean, my God, it was like a river of fire burning in the middle of my head. I wrote, I called up symbols. I used the mouse to drag everything where it was supposed to be. And when I was done, I had a letter. One of the special letters. But a letter to who? A letter to where? Then I realized it didn't matter. Made a few minor customizing touches. And there were many people the letter could go to. Although this one had been written for a man rather than a woman. I don't know how I knew that. I just did. I decided to start with Cincinnati only because Cincinnati was the first city that came to my mind. It could have easily been Zurich, Switzerland, or Waterville, Maine. I tried to open a tools program titled Dinky Mail. Before the computer would let me, it prompted me to wake up my modem. Once the modem was running, the computer wanted a 312 area code. 312 is Chicago. And I imagine that, as far as the phone company is concerned, 
My compy calls all come from Transcorp's headquarters. I didn't care one way or another. That was their business. I found my business and was taking care of it. With the modem awake and linked to Chicago, the computer flashed, dinky mail ready. I clicked on locale. I'd been in the study almost three hours by then, and with only one quick break to take a quick piss, I could smell myself, sweating and stinking like a monkey in a greenhouse. I didn't mind. I liked the smell. I was having the time of my life. <laughs> I was fucking delirious. I typed Cincinnati and hit execute. No listing Cincinnati, the computer said. Okay, not a problem. Try Columbus. Closer to home anyway. And yes, folks, we have a bingo. Two listings Columbus. There were two telephone numbers. I clicked on the top one, curious and a little afraid of what might pop out. But it wasn't a dossier, a profile, or God forbid, a photograph. There was one single word. Muffin. <laughs> Say what? <sighs> but then I knew. Muffin was Mr. Columbus's pet. Very likely a cat. I called up my special letter again, transposed two symbols, and deleted a third. Then I added Muffin to the top, with an arrow pointing down. There. <laughs> Perfect. Did I wonder who Muffin's owner was? or what he had done to warrant Transcorp's attention, or exactly what was going to happen to him? I did not. The idea that my conditioning at Peoria might have been partially responsible for this disinterest never crossed my mind either. I was doing my thing, that was all. Just doing my thing, and as happy as a clam at high tide. I called the number on the screen. I had the computer speaker on, but there was no hello. Only the screechy mating call of another computer. Just as well, really. Life's easier when you subtract the human element. Then it's like that movie 12 O'Clock High, cruising over Berlin in your trusty B-25, looking through your trusty Norden bomb site, waiting for just the right moment to push your trusty button. You might see smokestacks or factory roofs, but no people. The guys who dropped the bombs from their B-25s didn't have to hear the screams of mothers whose children had just been reduced to guts, and I didn't even have to hear anyone say hello. A very good deal. After a little bit, I turned off the speaker anyway. I found it distracting. Modem found, the computer flashed, and then, search for email address, Y slash N. I typed Y and waited. This time the wait was longer. I think the computer was going back to Chicago again and getting what it needed to unlock the email address of Mr. Columbus. Still, it was less than 30 seconds before the computer was right back at me with email address found, send dinky mail, Y slash N. I typed Y with absolutely no hesitation. The computer flashed, sending dinky mail, and then dinky mail sent. That was all. No fireworks. I wonder what happened to Muffin, though. You know, after? Part 16. That night I called Mr. Sharpton and said, I'm working. That's good, Dink. Great news. <laughs> Feel better? Calm as ever, Mr. Sharpton is like the weather in Tahiti. <laughs> yeah, I said. The fact was, I felt blissful. It was the best day of my life. Doubts or no doubts, worries or no worries, I still say that. The most eventual day of my life. It was like a river of fire in my head. <laughs> a fucking river of fire. Can you get that? <laughs> Do you feel better, Mr. Sharpton? Relieved? <laughs> I'm happy for you. But I can't say I'm relieved because you were never worried in the first place. <laughs> Got it in one. Everything's eventual. In other words, <laughs> he laughed at that. He always laughs when I say that. That's right, Dink. Everything's eventual. M Mr. Sharpton? Yes? Email's not exactly private, you know. Anyone who's really dedicated can hack into it. Part of what you send is a suggestion that the recipients delete the message from all files, is it not? Yes, but I can't absolutely guarantee that he'll do it, or she, even if they don't. 
Nothing can happen to someone else who chances on such a message. Am I correct? Because it's personalized. Well, it might give someone a headache, but that would be about all. And the communication itself would look so much like gibberish. Or a code. <laughs> Let them try and break it, Dinky, huh? <laughs> Let them try. <sighs> I sighed. I suppose. Let's discuss something more important, Dink. How did it feel? Fucking wonderful. Good. Don't question wonder, Dink. Don't ever question wonder. And he hung up. Part 17. Sometimes I have to send actual letters. Print out the stuff I womp up in Dinky's notebook. Stick it in an envelope. Lick stamps. And mail it off to somebody somewhere. Professor Ann Tevich, University of New Mexico. Mr. Andrew Neff, care of the New York Post. Billy Unger, General Delivery, Stovington, Vermont. Only names, but they were still more upsetting than the phone numbers. More personal than the phone numbers. It was like seeing faces swim up to you for a second inside your Norden bomb site. I mean, what a freak out, right? You're up there 25,000 feet, no faces allowed up there, and sometimes one shows up for a second or two just the same. I wonder how a university professor could get along without a modem, or a guy whose address was a fucking New York newspaper for that matter. But I never wondered too much. I didn't have to. We live in a modern world, but letters don't have to be sent by computer after all. There's still snail mail. And the stuff I really needed was always in the database. The fact that Unger had a 1957 Thunderbird, for instance, or that Ann Tevich had a loved one, perhaps her husband, perhaps her son, perhaps her father, named Simon. And people like Tevich and Unger were exceptions. Most of the folks I reach out and touch are like the first one in Columbus, fully equipped for the 21st century, sending dinky mail, dinky mail sent. Very good. So long, Charlie. I could have gone on like that for a long time, maybe forever. Browsing the database. I mean, there's no schedule to follow, no list of primary cities and targets. I'm completely on my own, unless all that shit is also in my subconscious down there on the uh, hard disk. Going to afternoon movies, enjoying the ma-less experience of my little house, dreaming of my next step up the ladder. Except I woke up feeling horny one day. I worked for an hour or so, browsing around in Australia, but it was no good. My dick kept trespassing on my brain, so to speak. So I shut off the computer and went down to News Plus to see if I could find a magazine featuring pretty ladies in frothy lingerie. As I got there, a guy was coming out, reading the Columbus Dispatch. I never read the paper myself. Well, why bother? It's the same old shit day in, day out. Dictators beating the Ching Chong out of people weaker than they are. Men in uniforms beating the Ching Chong out of soccer balls or footballs. Politicians kissing babies and kissing ass. Mostly stories about the Skipper Brannigans of the world, in other words. And I wouldn't have even seen this story, even if I'd happened to look at the newspaper rack display once I got inside, because it was on the bottom half of the front page below the fold. But this fucking dim bulb comes out with the paper hanging open and his face buried inside it. And in the lower right corner was a picture of a white-haired guy smoking a pipe and smiling. He looked like a good-humored fuck, probably Irish, eyes all crinkled up and these white bushy eyebrows. And the headline over the photo, not a big one, but you could read it, says, Neff's suicide still puzzles, grieves colleagues. For a second or two, I thought I'd just skip News Plus that day. I didn't feel like ladies in lingerie after all. Maybe I'd just go home, take a nap. If I went in, I'd probably pick up a copy of the dispatch. I wouldn't be able to help myself. And I wasn't sure I would wanted to know any more about that Irish-looking guy than I already did. Which was nothing at all. As you can fucking believe, I hastened to tell myself. Neff couldn't be that weird a name anyway. Only four letters. Not like Shittin' Dukas or Whore Cake. There must be thousands of Neffs, if you're talking coast to coast. This one didn't have to be the Neff I knew about. The one who loved Frank Sinatra records. 
It would be better in any case to just leave and come back tomorrow. Tomorrow, the picture of that guy with the pipe will be gone. Tomorrow, somebody else's picture will be there on the lower right corner of page one. People always dying, right? People who aren't superstars or anything. Just famous enough to get their picture down there in the lower right corner of page one. And sometimes people were puzzled about it. The way folks back home in Harkerville have been puzzled about Skipper's death. No alcohol in his blood, clear night, dry road, not the suicidal type. The world is full of mysteries like that, though. And sometimes it's best not to solve them. Sometimes the solutions aren't, you know, too eventual. But willpower has never been my strong point. I can't always keep away from the chocolate, even though I know my skin doesn't like it. And I couldn't keep away from the Columbus Dispatch that day. I went on inside and bought one. I started home, and then I had a funny thought. The funny thought was that I didn't want a newspaper with Andrew Neff's picture on the front page going out with my trash. The trash pickup guys came in a city truck. Surely they didn't, couldn't, have anything to do with Transcorp, but... (sighs) There was this show that me and Pug used to watch one summer way back when we were kids. Golden Years, it was called. You probably don't remember it. Anyway, there was this guy on the show who used to say, perfect paranoia is perfect awareness. It was like his motto, and I sort of believe that. Anyway, I went to the park instead of back home. I sat on a bench and read the story, and when I was done, I stuck the paper in a park trash barrel. I didn't even like doing that, but hey, if Mr. Sharpton's got a guy following me around and checking on every little thing I threw away, (laughs) I'm fucked up the wazoo no matter what. There was no doubt that Andrew Neff, age 62, a columnist for the Post since 1970, had committed suicide. He took a bunch of pills that probably would have done the trick, then climbed into his bathtub, put a plastic bag over his head, and rounded the evening off by slitting his wrists. There was a man totally dedicated to avoiding counseling. He left no note, though, and the autopsy showed no sign of disease. His colleagues scoffed at the idea of Alzheimer's or even early senility. He was the sharpest guy I'd ever known, right up to the day he died, a guy named Pete Hamill said. He could have gone on Challenge Jeopardy and run both boards. I have no idea why Andy did such a thing. Hamill went on to say that one of Neff's charming oddities was his complete refusal to participate in the computer revolution. No modems for him, no laptop word processors, no handheld spell checkers from Franklin Electronic Publishers. He didn't even have a CD player in his apartment, Hamill said. Neff claimed, perhaps only half-joking, that compact discs were the devil's work. He loved the chairman of the board, but only on vinyl. This guy Hamill and several others said Neff was unfailingly cheerful, Right up to the afternoon, he filed his last column, went home, drank a glass of wine, and then demoed himself. One of the Post's chatter columnists, Liz Smith, said she'd shared a piece of pie with him just before he left on that last day, and Neff had seemed a trifle distracted, but otherwise fine. Distracted, (laughs) sure. With a head full of fouders, bows, and smims, you'd be distracted too. Neff, the piece went on, had been something of an anomaly on the post, which sticks up for the more conservative view of life. I guess they don't come right out and recommend electrocuting welfare recipients after three years and still no job, but they do hint that it's always an option. I guess Neff was the house liberal. He wrote a column called A Neff is a Neff, and in it he talked about changing the way New York treated single teen mothers suggested that maybe abortion wasn't always murder, argued that the low-income housing in the outer boroughs was a self-perpetuating hate machine. Near the end of his life, he'd been writing columns about the size of the military and asked why we as a country felt we had to keep pouring on the bucks when there was essentially no one left to fight except for the terrorists. He said we'd do better to spend that money on creating jobs. And, post-readers, who would have crucified anyone else saying stuff like that, 
pretty much loved it when Neff laid it down. Because he was funny. Because he was charming. Maybe because he was Irish and had kissed the Blarney Stone. That was about it. I started home. Somewhere along the way, I took a detour, though, and I ended up walking all over downtown. I zigged and zagged, walking down boulevards and cutting through parking lots, all the time thinking about Andrew Neff climbing into his bathtub and putting a baggie over his head. A big one. A gallon size. Keeps all your leftovers supermarket fresh. He was funny. He was charming. And I had killed him. Neff had opened my letter and it had gotten into his head, somehow. Judging by what I'd read in the paper, the special words and symbols took maybe three days to fuck him up enough to swallow the pills and climb into the tub. He deserved it. That's what Mr. Sharpton said about Skipper. Maybe he was right that time. But did Neff deserve it? Was there shit about him I didn't know? Did he maybe like little girls in the wrong way, or push dope, or go after people too weak to fight back like Skipper had gone after me with a shopping cart? We want to help you use your talents for the betterment of all mankind, Mr. Sharpton said, and I surely didn't mean making a guy off himself because he thought the defense department was spending too much money on smart bombs. Paranoid shit like that is strictly for movies starring Steven Seagal and Jean-Claude Van Damme then I had a bad idea. A scary idea. Maybe Transcorp didn't want him dead because he wrote that stuff. Maybe they wanted him dead because people, the wrong people, were starting to think about what he wrote. That's crazy, I said right out loud. And a woman looking into the window of Columbus City's oh-so-pretty turned around and gave me the old fish eye. I ended up at the public library around two o'clock, with my legs aching and my head throbbing. I kept seeing that guy in the bathtub, with his wrinkled old man tits and white chest hair, his nice smile gone, replaced by this vague Planet X look. I kept seeing him put a baggie over his head, humming a Sinatra tune. My way, maybe as he snugged it down tight and then peered through it the way you'd peer through a cloudy window so he could see to slit the veins in his wrists. I didn't want to see that stuff, but I couldn't stop. My bomb sight had turned into a telescope. They had a computer room in the library, and you could get on the internet at a very reasonable cost. I had to get a library card, too, but that was okay. Library card's good to have. You can never have too much ID. It took me only three bucks worth of time to find Ann Tevich and call up the report of her death. The story started. I saw with a sinking sensation in the bottom right-hand corner of page one. The official dead folks nook. And then jumped to the obituary page. Professor Tevich had been a pretty lady, blonde, 37, In the photo, she was holding her glasses in her hand, as if she wanted people to know she wore them, but as if she wanted people to see what pretty eyes she had, too. That made me feel sad and guilty. Her death was startlingly like Skipper's, coming home from her office at UNM just after dark, maybe hurrying a little because it was her turn to make supper. But what the hell, good driving conditions and great visibility. Her car... Vanity license plate DNA fan, I happen to know, had veered off the road, overturned, land in a dry wash. She was still alive when someone spotted the headlights and found her, but there had never really been any real hope. Her injuries were too grave. There was no alcohol in her system and her marriage was in good shape. No kids, at least, thank God for small favors. So the idea of suicide was far-fetched. She had been looking forward to the future, had even talked about getting a computer to celebrate a new research grant. She'd refused to own a PC since 1988 or so, and lost some valuable data in one when it locked up, and had distrusted them ever since. She would use her department's equipment when she absolutely had to, but that was all. The coroner's verdict had been 
accidental death. Professor Ann Tevich, a clinical biologist, had been in the forefront of West Coast AIDS research. Another scientist, this one in California, said that her death might have set research for a cure back five years. She was a key player, he said. Smart, yes, but more. I once heard someone refer to her as a natural-born facilitator, and that's as good a descriptor as any. Anne was the kind of person who holds other people together. Her death is a great loss to the dozen people who knew and loved her, but it's an even greater loss to this cause. Billy Unger was also easy enough to find. His picture topped page one of the Stovington Weekly Current instead of getting stuck down there in the dead folks' nook. But that might have been because there weren't too many famous people in Stovington. Unger had been General William Rollum Unger, winner of the Silver Star and Bronze Star in Korea. During the Kennedy administration, he was an undersecretary of defense, acquisition reform, and one of the really big war hawks of the time. Kill the Ruskies, drink their blood, keep America safe for the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade, that sort of thing. Then, around the time Lyndon Johnson was escalating the war in Vietnam, Billy Unger had a change of mind and heart. He began writing letters to newspapers. He started his op-ed page career by saying that we were handling the war wrong. He progressed to the idea that we were wrong to be in Vietnam at all. Then, around 1975 or so, he got to the point of saying all wars were wrong. That was okay with most Vermonters. He served seven terms in the state legislature, starting in 1978, when a group of progressive Democrats asked him to run for the U.S. Senate in 1996. He said he wanted to do some reading and consider his options. The implication was that he would be ready for a national career in politics by 2000, 2002 with the latest. He was getting old, but Vermonters like old guys, I guess. 96 went past without Unger declaring himself a candidate for anything, possibly because his wife died of cancer. And before 2002 came around, he bought himself a big old dirt sandwich and ate every bite. There was a small but loyal contingent in Stovington which claimed Rollum's death was an accident, that Silver Star winners don't jump off their roofs even if they have lost a wife to cancer in the last year or so. But the rest pointed out that the guy probably hadn't been repairing his shingles. Not in his nightshirt. Not at two o'clock in the morning. Suicide was the verdict. Yeah, right. Kiss my ass and go to heaven. Part 18 I left the library and thought I'd head home. Instead, I went back to the same park bench again. I sat there until the sun was low and the place had pretty much emptied out of kids and frisbee-catching dogs. And although I'd been in Columbus City for three months by then, it was the latest I'd ever been out. That's sad, I guess. I thought I was living a life here, finally getting away from Ma and living a life, but all I've been doing is throwing a shadow. If people, certain people, were checking up on me, they might wonder why the change in routine... So I got up, went on home, boiled up a bag of that shit on a shingle stuff, and turned on my TV. I've got cable, the full package including premium movie channels, and I've never seen a single bill. <laughs> How's that for an eventual deal? I turned on Cinemax. Rutger Hauer was playing a blind karate fighter. I sat down on the couch beneath my fake Rembrandt and watched the show. I didn't see it but I ate my chow when I looked at it. I thought about stuff, about a newspaper columnist who had liberal ideas and a conservative readership, about an AIDS researcher who served an important linking function with other AIDS researchers, about an old general who changed his mind. I thought about the fact I only knew these three by name because they didn't have modems and email capability. There was other stuff to think about, too. Like how you could hypnotize a talented guy, or, or drug him, or maybe even expose him to other talented guys in order to keep him from asking any of the wrong questions or doing any of the wrong things. Like how you could make sure such a talented guy couldn't run away even if he happened to wake up to the truth. You do that by setting him up in what was essentially a cashless existence. 
a life where rule number one was no rat holing any extra dough, not even pocket change. What sort of talented guy would fall for something like that? A naive one, with few friends and next to no self-image. A guy who would sell you his talented soul for a few groceries and 70 bucks a week. Because he believes that's about what it's worth. I didn't want to think about any of that. I tried to concentrate on Rutger Hauer, doing all that amusing blind karate shit. Big <laughs> Pug would have laughed his ass off if he'd been there, believe me. So I wouldn't have to think about any of that. 200, for instance. There was a number I didn't want to think about. 200. 10 times 20, 40 times 5. CC to the old Romans. At least 200 times I'd pushed the button that brought the message Dinky Mail sent up on my screen. It occurred to me for the first time as if I was finally waking up that I was a murderer. A mass murderer. Yes, indeed. That's what it's come down to. Good of mankind, bad of mankind, indifferent of mankind. Who makes those judgments? Mr. Sharpton, his bosses, their bosses? It doesn't matter. I decided it didn't matter a fuck in a rabbit hutch. I further decided I really couldn't spend too much time moaning, even to myself, how I had been drugged, hypnotized, or exposed to some kind of mind control. The truth was, I'd been doing what I was doing because I loved the feeling I got when I was composing the special letters. The feeling that there's a river of fire running through the center of my head. Mostly, I'd been doing it because I could. That's not true, I said, but not real loud. I whispered it under my breath. They probably don't have any bugs planted here. Well, I'm sure they don't, but it's best to be safe. I started writing this... What is it? A report, maybe? I started writing this report later that night. As soon as the Rucker Hauer movie was over. I write in a notebook, though, not on the computer. And I write in plain old English. No Sanka fights, no bows, no smims. There's a loose floor tile under the ping-pong table down in the basement. That's where I keep my report. I just now looked back at how I started. I got a good job now, I wrote, and no reason to feel glum. <sighs> Idiot. Well, of course, any fool who can pucker is apt to whistle past the graveyard. When I went to bed that night, I dreamed I was in the parking lot of the Super Saver. Pug was there wearing his red duster and a hat on his head like the one Mickey Mouse wore in Fantasia. Yeah, that's the movie where Mickey played the Sorcerer's Apprentice. Halfway across the parking lot, shopping carts were lined up in a row. Pug would raise his hand, then lower it. Each time he did, a cart would start rolling by itself, gathering speed, rushing across the lot until it crashed into the brick side of the supermarket. They were piling up there a glittering junk heap of metal and wheels. For once in his life, Pug wasn't smiling. I wanted to ask him what he was doing and what it meant. But of course, I knew. He's been good to me, I told Pug in this dream. It was Mr. Sharpton I meant, of course. He's been really, really eventual. Pug fully turned to me then, I saw it wasn't Pug at all. It was Skipper. And his head had been smashed in all the way down to the eyebrows. Shattered hunks of skull stuck up in a circle, making him look like he was wearing a bone crown. You're not looking through a bomb sight, Skipper said and grinned. You are the bomb sight. How do you like that, dinkster? I woke up in the dark in my room sweating with my hands over my mouth and holding in a scream. So I guess I didn't like it very much. Part 19. Writing this has been a sad education, let me tell you. It's like, hey, Dink, welcome to the real world. 
Mostly it's the image of grinding up dollar bills in the kitchen pig that comes to me when I think about what's happened to me, but I know that's only because it's easier to think of grinding up money or chucking it into the storm drain than it is to think about grinding up people. Sometimes I hate myself. Sometimes I'm scared for my immortal soul, if I have one, and sometimes I'm just embarrassed. Trust me, Mr. Sharpton said, and I did. I mean, duh, how dumb can you get? I tell myself I'm just a kid, the same age as the kids who crew those B-25s I sometimes think about, that kids are allowed to be dumb. But I wonder if that's true when lives are at stake. And, of course, I'm still doing it. Yep. I thought at first that I wouldn't be able to. No more than the kids in Mary Poppins could keep floating around the house when they lost their happy thoughts. But I could. And once I sat down in front of the computer screen and that river of fire started to flow, I was lost. You see, at least I think you do, that this is why I was put on planet Earth. Can I be blamed for doing the thing that finishes me off? That completes me? Answer? Yes, absolutely. But I can't stop. Sometimes I tell myself that I've gone on because if I do stop, maybe even for a day, they'll know I've caught on and the cleaners will make an unscheduled stop. Except what they'll clean up this time will be me. But that's not why. I do it because I'm just another addict. Same as a guy smoking crack in an alley or some chick taking a spike in her arm. I do it because of the hateful fucking rush. I do it because when I'm working in Dinky's notebook, everything's eventual. It's like being caught in a candy trap. And it's all the fault of that dork who came out of the News Plus with his fucking dispatch open. If not for him... I'd still see nothing but cloud-hazy buildings up in the crosshair. No people, just targets. You are the bomb site, Skipper said in my dream. You are the bomb site, Dinkster. <sighs> That's true. I know it is. Horrible but true. I'm just another tool. Just the lens the real bombardier looks through. Just the button he pushes. What bombardier, you ask? Oh, come on, get real. I thought of calling him. How's that for crazy? Or maybe it's not. Call me anytime, Dink. Even three in the morning. That's what the man said. And I'm pretty sure that's what the man meant. About that, at least. Mr. Sharpton wasn't lying. I thought of calling him and saying... Do you want to know what hurts the most, Mr. Sharpton? That thing you said about how I could make the world a better place by getting rid of people like Skipper. The truth is, you're the guys like Skipper. Sure. And I'm the shopping cart they chase people with, laughing and barking and making race car sounds. I work cheap, too. At bargain basement rates, so far, I've killed over 200 people. And what did it cost Transcorp? A little house in a third-rate Ohio town, 70 bucks a week, and a Honda automobile. Oh, plus cable TV. <laughs> Don't want to forget that. I stood there for a while looking at the telephone and put it down again. <sighs> Couldn't say any of that. It would be the same as putting a baggie over my head and slitting my wrists. So what am I going to do now? Oh, God. What am I going to do now? Part 20. It's been two weeks since I last took this notebook out from under the basement tile and wrote in it. Twice I've heard the mail slot clack on Thursdays during As the World Turns and gone out into the hall to get my money. I've gone to four movies, all in the afternoon. Twice I've ground up money in the kitchen pig and thrown my loose change down the storm drain, hiding what I was doing behind the blue plastic recycling basket when I put it down on the curb. One day I went down to News Plus, 
thinking I'd get a copy of Variations or Forum. But there was a headline on the front of the dispatch that once again took away any sexy feelings I might have had. Pope dies of heart attack on peace mission, it said. Did I do it? Uh, No. The story says he died in Asia, and I've been sticking to the American Northwest these last few weeks. But I could have been the one. If I'd been nosing around in Pakistan last week, I very likely would have been the one. Two weeks of living in a nightmare. Then this morning, there was something in the mail. Not a letter. I've only gotten three or four of those. All from Pug, and now he's stopped writing, and I miss him so much. But a Kmart advertising circular. It flopped open just as I was putting it in the trash, and something fluttered out. A note printed in block letters. Do you want out? It read. If yes, send message, don't stand so close to me, is best police song. My heart was beating hard and fast the way it did on the day I came into my house and saw the Rembrandt print over the sofa where the velvet clowns had been. Below the message, someone had drawn a fouter. It was harmless just sitting there all by itself, but looking at it still made all the spit in my mouth dry up. It was a real message. The fouter proved it. But who had it come from? How did the sender know about me? I went into the study, walking slowly with my head down, thinking. A message tucked into an advertising circular. Hand-printed and tucked into an advertising circular. That meant someone close by. Someone in town. I turned on my computer and modem. I called the Columbia City Public Library, where you can surf cheap and a relative anonymity. Anything I sent would go through Transcorp in Chicago, but that wasn't going to matter. They weren't going to suspect a thing. Not if I was careful. And, of course, if anybody was there. There was. My computer connected with the library's computer, and a menu flashed on my screen. For just a moment, something else flashed on my screen as well. A smim. In the lower right-hand corner. Just a flicker. I sent the message about the best police song and added a little touch of my own down in the dead folks' nook. A sankophyte. I could write more. Things have started to happen, and I believe that soon they'll be happening fast. But I don't think it would be safe. Up to now, I've just talked about myself. If I went any further, I'd have to talk about the other people. But there are two more things I want to say. First, that I'm sorry for what I've done. For what I did to Skipper, even. I'd take it back if I could. I didn't know what I was doing. I know that's a piss-poor excuse, but it's the only one I have. Second, I've got it in mind to write one more special letter. The most special of all. I have Mr. Sharpton's email address. And I have something even better. A memory of how he stroked his lucky tie as we sat in his big, expensive Mercedes. The loving way he ran his palm over those silk swords. So you see, I know just enough about him. I know just what to add to his letter. How to make it eventual. I can close my eyes and see one word floating there in the darkness behind my lids. Floating there like black fire. Deadly as an arrow fired into the brain. And it's the only word that matters. Excalibur. The End. STS Spooktober was produced in collaboration with Stories Telling Stories and STS Media Group, writing you a personal letter at Milt House Studios in Milton, Vermont, casting around the globe to your frontal lobe wherever podcasts are found. Spooktober is also streaming on YouTube at Stories Telling Stories. Make sure to give us a review wherever you stream our show. We'd really appreciate it. You can show your support for free by following us on Facebook and Instagram, Help us get to 500 subscribers by subscribing to our YouTube channel, 
And if you so choose, going a step further and supporting us on Patreon for a dollar a month or more. And until next year, stay spooky. Ha, 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 ha.